friends, this is David Voth. Today is May 28, 2015. It's great to see everybody today. Got some great information for you again today. But this is going to be, uh, wow, some really uh, interesting things that I doubt whether you've ever heard before. Uh, we've got to understand just how far we have been deceived. I mean, we've been going through some stuff that I think most of you probably, you know, will admit is just it's big stuff. You know, we haven't heard this before. And we've been lied to. And, you know, going into this, most of you probably thought, well, you know, what do you mean we're lied to? I mean, we got a Bible. We read the Bible. There's Moses. There's Jesus. How we were lied to. Well, you're beginning to see. Okay. It's just the twist on everything the the mystery behind everything that's never revealed and we go through this you know for years thinking well you know there's a mystery about that there's a mystery about that we don't know who that person was in the bible but he lived over there somewhere in the east but we don't know who he was and but of course he he met abraham and he had some priest that, this is just kind of a little mystery who, who jethro was we don't know from the east had a priesthood who's this guy named balaam you know the priest of Midian, blessing Israel, that whomsoever he blesses is blessed, and whomsoever he curses is cursed. Well, we, you know, we don't know, and it's just, there's all these mysteries, we don't even know where, who Abraham was. He came from over across the Euphrates, you know, from the land of Ur, and, you know, we, we know very little about where he came from. But in this video, friends, if you'll hang on and, and watch the whole video, you're going to learn something because the Bible itself has books in it you've never read. And those books tell the history of that eastern priesthood that is greater than the priesthood of Moses. You know, isn't it a little strange? We, we read about from Abraham down through Moses. And that, you know, once Moses gets there, that's the lower priesthood. But we talked, you know, we talked about Jethro and Melchizedek who came out to bless Abraham. Where, where's the information? about Melchizedek if he's got the greater priesthood because you see the the priesthood that went through Moses I just talked about the law and the carnal things that had to be done away and you know and Christ came and removed it so that we could have grace but the Melchizedek priesthood knew all this all along their priesthood was never veiled why don't they write stuff why don't we have their scriptures well, friends, the, their scriptures are all over the world, but the most amazing thing is some of them are right there in your Bible. And I'm going to show you and read right out of the Bible some of these more ancient prophets that are even more ancient than Moses, but are right there in your Bible. We're going to get to that in a little bit, so stay tuned. There's so many mysteries. Why is it that the Bible only gives us the history and very scantily so back maybe 12 1300 years ago and after that you know if you start going further back you got very little information and then once you get to abraham that's it there's like three pages of history from the flood or from adam you know to abraham we don't know who these people were we were you got all the people arguing you know, about all this history. Well, who who is Genesis 6 4 talking about? Who are the sons of God? Who are the men of renown? What was all this history? And and you got a religion here and a religion there. Some of these religions, they're they're very dogmatic. You know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, they've got their own views on Genesis 6 4. And it's like, well, we know what this is talking about. No, we don't go by any exterior knowledge or books. We don't read any of that, <laughs> that hokey pokey stuff. We don't we don't read that Enoch or Jasher. You know, we're not gonna get into any kind of Herodotus or you know, Pliny or Josephus. Nope. We're the faithful and wise servant and we're gonna tell you what it means. Based on three lines somewhere in a book, and who cares that that was completely lifted out of entire documents that we have now discovered that actually tells us what was going on there but we don't need to read that no we don't we don't care that that the word 200 
in the book of Enoch that fell, those angels that fell, is the very same number it speaks of in the Sumerian tablets and speaks of them there and tells us they're the Iggy and what happened to them and why they were there and how that, you know, they were imprisoned upon the earth and how the Allen belt was put around the world as a radiation belt so they couldn't get out. You know, this is the abyss that they're imprisoned in and, and, and the Bible speaks of this stuff and, you know, like just real, you know, subliminally, like in Revelation, some little, you know, book chapter 9, and it says, and there's this bottomless pit, and they were thrown in there. And they have a, a, you know, the angel of the pit, or that messenger, one of those Anunnaki, who, who was in prison there, and his name is pa Apollo. Well, we've heard about that guy in Greek mythology, but of course, we don't go by Greek mythology. We don't know anything about it, and we don't want to read about it. You know, who cares about this place called Tartarus? It doesn't exist because we go to buy the Bible and the Bible talks about this bottomless pit, which we don't know much about and we don't care because we're only going to go by what the Bible says. Wait a minute. You mean Tartarus means the lowest region of Hades and the Bible uses that word Hades and the lower regions? Oh, well, perhaps Tartarus is the, you know, the Greek equivalent of, of the, you know, bottomless pit in Hebrew. All right. Sometimes we translate it abyss. All right, well, that's the equivalent. Okay, well, I'd go for that. Okay, well, Peter says the angels were thrown into there. You know, and the Sumerian tablets calls these angels by name. Tells you who they are. And it explains Genesis 6, 4. All right, so I'm just making the point that there's a lot of information that we're missing. A lot of you don't like the fact that I'm going back into these, these other records and reading them. Okay, nobody said that I'm going to you know, lay down my life for these books that were written. I don't think you should lay down your life for any book. We don't go by the letter of the law. But if you're going to read any book, let's say we're going to read the Bible just to discover what the truth is and the history and what God wants us to do. All right, we're reading along in there and God says, okay, and about 5,000 years ago, there was a, a deity named Bilderberger and he came down to the earth and he got real mad and stood on the mountain, spit on the ground and twirled around and gave us a book. And this is what we're, we're supposed to believe now. All right. And that's all you got. Now you find another document that tells you who this guy was, why he came here. And a little more information that expands this information out so that we know what's actually talking about. All right. This is just history. This is explanations. This is knowledge. Hereby, this means eternal life, friends. Taking in knowledge of you, the only true God, and of the one whom you sent forth, Jesus Christ. We've got to have knowledge, and you've got, you know, people are talking about, oh, we got to have, you know, we got to do what the law says. We got to be righteous. Well, Paul says, add to your virtue knowledge. Okay, because you see, we don't stop just at virtue. There's all kinds of things that we've got to do in this in this life. One of the things we've got to have is knowledge, because you see, my people are perishing for lack of knowledge. And it's only through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that we're going to be saved. And that means not just to know of him, but to know what he taught and to listen and do what he says. Okay, we've got to be able to discern between the flesh and the spirit. That's what that sword or the word of God is. And it's got two edges and it's able to, to, to cut between the flesh and the bone. What does that mean? The hard core truth and that part that's just fleshly and of no importance. We've got to understand and we've got to be able to determine when we read words, whether they are symbolic whether they are parabolic or whether they are historic. Because you see, the Bible does teach parable. It doesn't just blatantly throw you a bunch of lies. It's, it tells you that it's a parable. And some of the histories that are in the Bible are very long histories summed up in a little parable or perhaps just a few lines. But you've got to have enough wisdom to understand you need more information. Okay, so I, I don't want to go into hours of this, but I wanted to set this up because I want you to understand that there is a lot that you have been missing. Now, um, 
a lot of you think, when you look at the Old Testament, you say, well, this is just about the Jews. They're the chosen people. That's it. We read that. Genesis, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and that's it. You see? That's the oldest part of the Bible. And that's we starts off Genesis and we go forward. And then we got some prophets and some Psalms. And this is all from God. All right. Well, what about, did you know that the oldest book in the Bible is actually the book of Job? You know, the largest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. Psalms and Job, Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. These books, do you know what they are? They're very old. Did you know that the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs says that it's the, the writings of ancient wise men? You think David wrote all these Psalms? You think Solomon wrote all these, you know, phrases and wisdom? You know, parts of the book of Proverbs come straight out of the Egyptian records, which were written by Joseph. He was one of these wise men that wrote these sayings down, that they preserved and they continued on with these things. And they were handed down. Why does the Jews got a book named Job? He wasn't a Jew. He was far, he was older than Abraham. Job was from the land of Oz. You know, we, we, we sometimes we say the land of Uz, but it's a, it's a double O-Z, Uz. Okay, I like to say the land of Oz. Where was that? And why is it that they're always telling you stuff like, oh, don't, you don't need to know where that was. Uh, this is one of the greatest and wisest men that ever lived, it says in that book. Okay, and it's very one of the largest books in the Bible. It's the oldest book in the Bible, but you're not supposed to know who he was and where he came from. Oh, but we're supposed to know where Israel came from. We, we, we got to know where Abraham came from. We got to know who Jacob is, and they're the chosen people. But who is Job? We, well, don't worry about that. You don't need to know who he is. He's from the east. Oh, well. That's, you know, east could mean anywhere. It's probably just 50 miles east of Jerusalem, right? You ever hear him tell you stuff like that? Oh, he's from the land of East. Midianites were from the east, right? So they were just probably over there about 50 miles from Jerusalem. East of Jerusalem, 50 miles. Uh, no, because today when we talk about the east, we, we, we mean China. We talk about the west, we mean, you know, Europe or, or further west America. We talk about the North. We, if we're in North America, we're talking about Canada. You know, we don't have to say Canada. We just have their North. We don't have to say, you know, South, South America. We don't have to say Brazil. We can just say South America. So the same goes for those people in that time. Those people in Israel didn't say, oh, the men of the East, and they meant 50 miles from Jerusalem. They meant the men of the East beyond the river Euphrates east of the river Euphrates. Well, who's Uz? You know, what's the land of Uz? All right, well, in the book of Genesis, it says, it mentions several people in the Bible named Uz, but, you know, we can't just pull somebody out of, you know, book of Acts or, or you know, uh, a couple hundred years ago and assume this is it, because remember, this is Job. He's very ancient. He's talking about somebody named Uz or Oz. He's talking about somebody that was well established in his day, and he's in the day of Abraham. So who could that be? You know, a lot of people don't realize this. They're saying, well, maybe it's this Uz that's spoken up here in Jeremiah somewhere or somewhere else, you know. Um, that person came long after Job. So let's, you know, let's look at the only guy whose name was Uz that lived that long ago, and he's the son of Shem. Remember, Shem was alive when Abraham was alive. So the land of Uz had got to be a land that was well identified by the time, you know, Abraham was there, who was a contemporary with Shem. And we don't have anybody beyond, you know, before the flood, there's only eight people survived. So <clears throat> the son of Shem's got to be the one. It says the sons of Shem were Elam and Asher and Arpachshad, and Lud, and Aram, and Uz, and Hul, and Gether, and Meshach, and that's in Chronicles, First Chronicles 1, the chap first chapter of Chronicles. It's in Genesis chapter 10, it mentions Uz. So, interesting, because um, Abraham kept talking about the East. 
right? He went out to meet Melchizedek, who had a higher priesthood. The book of Hebrews tells us about that. We've talked about that. And um, so this priesthood is a higher priesthood. We've talked about how every time we run across this higher priesthood, it's always from the east. See, and of course, you're going to be told in Sunday school that was 40 miles from the from the Jordan River. Right? That's not east. That's the land of Palestine. That's where they're at. You say, oh, well, maybe it was a little bit further east over there in Arabia. No. Okay, because we're talking about the land of Job before Abraham at that time. The land of the east. An entire land, a people, a vast you know, place. And now there's one people that are in the west. There's a people in the south. There's a people in the north. And these are the people in the east. East of what? Somewhere on the earth. Okay, the whole world didn't exist right there in Palestine. Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees across the Euphrates. He knew where the east was. Friends, don't be deceived. The world is much bigger than just Israel. And all you've ever been told is that book's about Israel. I hear so many people saying, oh, well, uh, you, you don't believe in that Old Testament. You don't believe in it, right? No, I said I didn't believe in the law. I don't believe we're under it. I certainly believe in it. I know that Moses gave the law. I know that, you know, that I accept the word of the prophets and the apostles. And Paul says it was given by the hand of angels. I certainly accept, you know, there in the book of Acts, that the, the tent that they carried in the wilderness was the tent of Molech. And God didn't like their sacrifices. I, I certainly agree and believe in the Old Testament and the words that it speaks there. And how God gave them up unto these sacrifices. And said, mine angel shall go ahead of you and he will not pardon you. Because that angel doesn't pardon nobody. He not like me. You see, I'm a God of mercy. But this guy's name is Jealous. I believe it, friends. And I also believe that that book, that book we're calling the Old Testament, it's not really just all about the Jews. As I said before, there are books in the Bible that you have never even been told about. Now we're, we're talking about one of the largest books in the Bible, a man older than the Jewish people, who, according to the Bible, was the greatest, one of the greatest men that ever lived, but he wasn't even an Israelite. And well, maybe we should look into this, because this man was a son of Shem. He was the same kind of thing like Melchizedek, maybe even a higher priesthood. Well, it's kind of funny because it says that he had uh, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 spans of cattle and 500 she-asses, along with a very large body of servants. And he was the greatest of all the men of the East. Yeah, he was the, <laughs> he was the greatest of all those 10 people over there by the, you know, this East of the Jordan River there, 40 miles, and that little... You know, there was 48 people there, and he was the greatest of those 48 men. No. He was the greatest of all the people of the East. On earth, that jurisdiction on earth called the East, this man was the greatest. Isn't that funny? How everything from the East turns out to be the greatest? We got the greatest man. Came from the East. A higher priesthood came from the east. Jethro's priesthood came from the east. Balaam, whomever he blesses is blessed, and whomever he curses is cursed, came from the east, from Midian, and that was a, 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 a of the one of the daughters of Abraham, because you see Abraham got the high priesthood from Melchizedek, who came from the east, and one of Melchizedek's sons was this Uz. Now, I hear a lot of you saying, oh, but the Bible says that Edom is in the land of Uz. So it must be Esau and Edom. No, it just says Edom was in the land of Uz. Remember when God told Esau to, you know, go and find his place where he was going to live. And he chose the land of East and he took off and that's where he went. He went to the land of, to Mount Seir. But Mount Seir is not his name. He went there to live. He went to the East to live. So that's where he went, to the land of us, to the land of the east. Didn't mean that, you know, that land was already there when he got there, friends. So Seir, Mount Seir, has nothing to do with Esau, other than the fact that that's where he went, to the land of the east.
to the land of Mount Seir. Okay. So, um, the land of Uz has nothing to do with Esau other than that's where he went. Uz has, is not one of the sons of Esau or, you know, or anything like that because Esau, friends, came long after the time of Job and could not have been alive in the days of Job. You've got to use your noggin. But you see, a lot of the, the things that you're being, you know, there's so much to think and consider that, of course, you know, you're just going to automatically bring files up out of your brain that you've already been told this stuff. If you had a chance to think, you wouldn't think that way. So, what are these 7,000 sheep? It's a symbolic number, friends. Remember how Jethro had some sheep? And remember how Moses became the shepherd of Jethro's sheep? The Bible does not speak arbitrarily, friends. You know, a lot of you say, I don't believe in it. Okay, I certainly do believe in it, and I certainly believe what it's trying to tell me. Okay, you've got to look at it, not by the letter of the law, but by the spirit, and by the parables there. And you've got to be able to open those parables and see what it's really saying. Okay, Jethro had sheep because Jethro was a priest, and sheep are the, the flock that you, you know, Jesus said, I'm the shepherd, I'm the great shepherd. You say, well, I understand that, symbol, he's not a, you know, Jesus wasn't a sheep herder, <laughs> Jesus was the shepherd of our souls. Well, so was Jethro, a Midianite from the land of the east. And Moses became a shepherd of Jethro's sheep. And it was Moses that was veiled. It was Jethro that helped Moses develop this lower priesthood that went off with the Jews. The higher priesthood that came from the east with Melchizedek and Jethro and, and, and Job there, the greatest man in the east, the higher priesthood, they're the ones who own the sheep. Okay, Jesus is the shepherd of the sheep. So Jesus is the real shepherd, and he condemned the Jewish people and the Levites and that lower priesthood and that law. You say, I don't believe in the Old Testament. Yes, I do. I believe in that whole book. Do you? Many of you out there, you've got to be able to understand the book. You can't just say you believe in it. You've got to understand it. Believing in it and understanding it's two different things, friends. So he had 7,000 sheep. Interestingly, though, he had 500 cows. Well, a cow is something you put a bit in. You don't do that with sheep. Sheep is something, it's like your flock. But a cow is, is something you, you, you plow your field with. You know, the strength of an ox, right? And you put a bit in its mouth and it does the work and it, 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 it plows your field so you can have bread sustenance. So that bull is the flesh. The animal list the animalistic nature of the flesh that you tame and you put to work that's the flesh muzzled by the bit that's the flesh that is become tamed by the spirit that's put to good use that is being properly used it's not you know some wild ravenous beast but an ox represents the nature of the flesh that is put into subjection as it's supposed to be and so the 500 cows that he had, five again being the physical senses. So here is a man that is the owner of all of this world through this priesthood that he has. And he's got all the sheep from the beginning to the end, 7,000. And he was tested by the Lord. And who tested him? Satan. See, we're all being tested by Satan. This is a very big book, and this is the book that talks about the stars, and it talks about um, the Pleiades and Orion. It has all this great wisdom that most of us have never even read before. Well, we're just studying that book of Moses, right, and all those laws, and oh, okay, let's see now. Uh, we got to have a slave, and we put something in his ear, and we beat him until he's half dead, but we can't do this, and we can rape people, and we can do that, and we're going to study all this out, and they have festivals, and... And the festival comes on the seventh day of the seventh month of the seventh year. Oh, boy. You know, is it today? Did you get ready for the festival? This is so important. Because if we keep this festival just right, 
and have our, our garment just right length and the fringe just the way we're supposed to and we wear that you know bracelet and, this, and the hat and the little beanie cap you know and we say the right words and um and we have the little prayer beads then we can get to heaven who cares about the rest of the bible right this is more important we believe you don't believe in the bible if you don't believe in in all these laws of moses but you know hey maybe maybe you should look at the book of job it's part of the bible isn't it have you ever read the book of job have you ever read the book of proverbs do you really study that one? Because that's got the wisdom of many of the ancient ones. And that's one of the things I want to talk about in this video today, friends. Now, the book of Proverbs has about a thousand verses inside it. But we're told that Solomon made all this himself and wrote it all down. Even though it says it right there in the book, it says Solomon composed 3,000 proverbs or parables. And we know that some of them were very long, not just one line, you know, little parables. Okay, in Proverbs 1 7, you read from there to the end of chapter 9, and that's a single proverb. Okay, so that's what, nine chapters, one single proverb, and yet Song Solomon wrote 3,000 proverbs. Where are they, friends? Well, the truth is that it, right there in the in the introduction of the book of Proverbs, there is a superscription. There are six verses in which it shows that many of the Proverbs in this book didn't even originate with Solomon. The introduction states that the Proverbs that were selected to be included into that book, that canon, that little book of Proverbs, and they were there to show wisdom and instruction, understanding. It says they were to be uh, for justice and judgment. And it says in Proverbs 1, 6, to understand a proverb or a parable and the interpretation, the words of the wise ones, plural, because in Hebrew it's plural, the wise ones, and their dark sayings. Okay, so who are these wise ones? Right at the beginning, right out the gate, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 6 tells us, is this all going to be about this, about these wise ones? But you don't know who they are. Why have we not been told? So the book of Proverbs doesn't just contain Proverbs from King Solomon, but also from those who were the wise men. But who were they? And these were wise men, or ancient philosophers, you see. That's just the way that they're translating it. And the way they translate it, they keep us pretty much in the dark. See, a lot of people, Christians say, oh, we don't believe in that philosophy stuff. We're not into that Magi stuff. We're not into this, these wise men, these three wise men that came and told us where Jesus was born. Because you see, that's paganism. Boy, that's something we got to stay away from. We don't want no wise men in the Christian church. Right? We don't want to forget that patriarch Joseph. He interpreted the Pharaoh's dream about that famine. It was going to be for seven years and it was going to, you know, wipe out the Eastern world. And Pharaoh admitted, there is none so discreet and wise as you. So Joseph's one of these wise men. Did you know that Joseph used divination? Have you read the Bible, friends? Well, why would the Bible call Joseph a wise man if he was a diviner? If you don't like divination well see joseph didn't have the law of moses he existed before moses okay moses hadn't even come along yet and veiled all this truth joseph lived way back when almost in time of job one of the greatest well the greatest of the orientals and there were other wise men those of the east it always talks about the wise men of the east like in job they had their residence in the land of Uz. And that's got to be some place, as we've discussed, far, far, you know, in the east of this world. Orientals had nothing to do with Israel, and yet they were wise. They worshipped the true God. Said Balaam worshipped the true God. who feared God. Jethro feared God. So there's a lot of activity in the days, you know, before Israelites and law of Moses. There's all this 
wise men stuff going on in the east and in Egypt. So look at Proverbs 22, 17 through 21. It says, bow down your ear and hear the words of the wise ones and apply your heart unto my knowledge for it is a pleasant thing if you keep these proverbs. They shall be fitted in your lips that your trust may be in the Lord. I have made known unto you this day, even to you. Have not I written to you excellent things? So you see, if you read it there, it just says excellent things. But in the more correct translations, of modern translations, it says 30 parables, or 30 verses, or 30 proverbs. And he actually says, have I not made known unto you these 30 proverbs? It doesn't say I made them up or I, you know, I'm the, the source of these proverbs, but I made known unto you. So there's actually 30 sections to this third division in the book of Proverbs. It's from chapter 22, 22 to 24, 22. Now the Revised Standard Version and the New English Bible and the, uh, many of the other modern translations they realize that this is a reference to 30. This is the reference to 30 is that proper translation in Proverbs 22, 20. From the use of that word excellent. But now scholars are assured that it's 30 and, and not excellent. So why are they certain? Because this section of Proverbs has been found in a manuscript from ancient Egypt. That's right, friend. Yeah, Paul. So, you know, some of the writings that we have in our Bible that you thought was, oh, this is from the Jews, okay? This is from Egypt. It's from the land of the wise ones. Right? You can't deny this, friends. That Egyptian document's in the British Museum. And a part of the text is also found on a writing tablet in Italy. And those are the original 30 sayings that is talked about there in, in Proverbs. And they were written by Egyptian priests and they were called the instruction of Amen Aben Opat. Or Amen Opus, which means, you know, Amen Joseph. That's the prophet Joseph. The date when they were originally written is, uh, it's their discourse to dispute that. We never know anything, right? We never know anything because everybody wants, there's always somebody trying to, to keep the truth from you. The book was a product of Joseph's time. And then they just wrote it down later on in the book of Proverbs. So this is something that how why is it that we haven't been told this, friends? They don't want you to know this. Friends, many of you out there that are saying that, you know, everything I'm telling you is just a bunch of lies and people need to stay away from it. I'm going to hell. I can't stop teaching the truth, friends. Because you must know that we've been lied to. You must know there's a deceiver running around. He's been hiding things from you. You must be able to certainly, certainly you can see that there's 66 books of the Bible. And, and if you, many of you believe in these numbers and, you know, you see the word six and you stand back in horror. So answer me, why are there 66 books in the Bible? Isn't it because it's not all there, friends? It's not complete. It's not seven. Seven is complete. We're missing a lot, friends. But just from what we've got, it, it lets us know that there's more. But now that we find out that this is just an excerpt, we need to go back and read that Egyptian book. The whole book. Because according to Scripture, and according to, the, to Solomon, Sol Aman, that book was sacred from the wise men and his name was Joseph and he's the one who taught the truth he was a prophet one of the wise men who lived in Egypt the son of Abraham so we've got to consider all of the information friends we can't just you know if you if you're this is our life this is our eternal life okay we don't just you know, well, I was born a, a Catholic, you know, well, that's as far as I'm going to go with it. I'm going to just go to church every Sunday and get the holy water sprinkled on me and I'll go to heaven. See, 
Whatever that priest tells me, that's what I'm going to do. Don't you think you need to do, you know, do a little investigation, friends? You say, well, I was born the Seventh-day Adventist. And, and, of course, I know we have the truth because we keep the Sabbath. Right? Have I ever read the Bible? No. No, but I read all the works of Ellen G. White. She was a prophet. She plagiarized all of that? Oh, well, she was wrong about certain things like that God was going to come back in 1844 and we're just hiding that now with that. Well, okay, but still, I like it. I, you know, I'm a, my mom's an Adventist, my dad's an Adventist, and it's got to be true. Have I done any investigation other than with the church that I'm affiliated? No, I haven't. Well, I read a book once. Friends, you're going to have to read a lot of books because your knowledge, you, you're like in this maze of, of, of information that's all false. And, and the minute you see that one of the things you were taught was wrong, you need to keep going because you'll uncover a lot more. There's a lot more falsehood that they've told you. Now, let's go and let's consider these works. Let's just read it. Just just curiously, all right? If, if you're just curious, why don't you take a look? Maybe you don't have time to read the Sumerian tablets. Maybe you don't have time to read the Egyptian works, one of which is called the Instruction of the Visor or the Prime Minister, Tahotap. Okay, the man who wrote that document, Proverbial Teachings, he was close to Pharaoh and he was considered Pharaoh's son. He wasn't the son, but he was considered his son. And it's called, now they call this book the oldest book in the world. That's what they call it. All right, now many of you are read, reading your Bibles and parts of the Bible is the excerpts from the oldest book in the world. Isn't that fascinating? But you've never been told that. Now, here is an excerpt from the, it's called the Instructions of Tahotep. When you're sitting at meat at the house of a person greater than you, look at what is before you. That's precept 7. Here is uh, Proverbs 23, verse 1. When you sit to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before you. So this passage is found in the Proverbs of Solomon in chapter 23, and the Hebrews knew this. They knew what this was. This was ancient wisdom from the wise one from Egypt. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Precept number 12. If you are a wise man, train a son who will be well-pleasing to God. They're slightly different translations. It's come down to us in a different translation, but it's the same precept, the same parable, the same proverb. See, a lot of you are thinking, oh, we, you know, we don't want to read that stuff from Egypt, that pagan stuff. There ain't no morals in there. Only The only morals you can get is from the book of Moses, you know, where it says kill everybody and rape their women and children and, 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 and stone your mother. That's where we get all our morals, but... You start reading that Egyptian pagan stuff, and that's bad. Hmm, well, I just read you some of this ancient Egyptian stuff, and it sounds pretty good. In fact, it's the story of Joseph. They both lived 110 years. Uh, it was, they lived in the third dynasty. And Joseph history is the third dynasty saw seven years of low Nile river flows. Uh, the name of Tahotep was a title of all Memphite visors, those second in command to the Pharaoh himself, and Joseph was also second in command of Pharaoh. He was the visor, as all scholars admit. And that's in Genesis 41. Uh, Tahotep was one of no account in Egypt, but had been elevated to the prime ministership. And that's the same with Joseph. He was raised from the dungeon to sit at the very throne of Pharaoh. And uh, also, out of thousands who went into their neighbors' wives, Tahotep did not, and he taught people not to do this. This is also something that was very, you know, this was taught by Joseph, and he did this thing, and it happened to him the same way. Tahotep received from his father divine laws, and uh, Joseph was also taught these divine laws from his father Abraham who got it from Melchizedek 
and it was handed down from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob to Joseph. Tahotep was a monotheist, and there was no idolatry there in that book, and that is an Egyptian document. There was no idolatry. Joseph also taught the same, the same things, uh, the one God, no idols. Uh, Tahotep's teachings, they went actually written down in the Bible, there and also in Proverbs especially, and Solomon quoted from these. Tahotep received a double possession of his father because of his obedience. This is the same thing that has happened to Joseph. Talks about that in Chronicles chapter 5 verse 2. Tahotep warns those of advanced knowledge such as he had to shun being puffed up with pride. And so this is also something that Joseph of Egypt did. He was very humble. And Tahotep was the first in Egypt whose great public works made him famous. And this is also what happened with Joseph. And there was only one man who was brought up from the dungeon and became great in the kingdom of Egypt and did all of the things that these two men did and wrote these ancient parables and were wise men. So these are the same people. But what I really want to get to in all of this and, you know, is... All right, so we've got all this literature, and it goes back. But today, all we have is this, you know, all Christians will accept. Remember, there's, oh my goodness, hundreds and hundreds of books that we just don't. There is absolutely no reason that the canon of Scripture that we have only includes these 66 books. Except that it has been divinely preordained that that accepted book would be incomplete. And for those who do not wish to know the truth, They'll stop there and they'll only know a part and they'll be deceived. And that is why that is there. But there are books, the book of Tobit, Jasher, you know, there's the book of Wisdom. There's, you know, the book of Enoch. Most of you have been discussing this, Jasher. The book of Noah, we found excerpts from, pieces of it, the Nagamati Library and, you know, on and on and on. The Emerald Tablets, Sumerian Tablets, the Babylonian cuneiform tablets, the Egyptian works of, you know, all of this that we've just read, and all of it's important. And I, I understand many of you can't read all these books. It's just, but what I want you to know is that much of what we have as Christians in this book is limited. So the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Job. And this is from the East. From the greatest man of the East, a man who was a shepherd of the sheep and who had 7,000 sheep, a man who had to keep his cows in subjection. All right. Now, what can we learn from this? Because you see, uh, this is the point. Many of you are hanging on to the little group of laws that were written by Moses and somehow you think that's wisdom. But what does the Bible, your own Bible, tell you? What is wisdom? Because that's a question that is asked by God and, and by Job. And that's in your Bible, as you have it in those 66 books. Job says, where can wisdom be found? And where does understanding dwell? Job 28 and verse 12. Does life have any meaning? All right. Do we get meaning from the laws of Moses who veiled his face and spoke to an angel in, 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 a, in, a, in you know, flashing lights and powers of trumpets and fear and panic and, and dark clouds and, and thunders? And a God who says, I am jealous and you will do it and you'll rape the people and you'll murder them and go to war and fight. Is this the wisdom that we're searching for? Well, this is the question that God was um, explaining to Job. This is this oldest book, the wisest man in the East. This is what the message of this book is. Have you ever read it? Maybe you should read this book as well. Okay, and because in this book, we find out that Job is being persecuted. His life is miserable. And um, he's being accused of being a sinner. You know, he's saying, well, look, you know, all these wise men come along from uh, back from, you know, people who believed in Mosaic, 
you know, eye for an eye stuff. And they're saying, okay, Job, uh, here you are sitting in a pile of ashes scraping your ulcers. You lost your family, all your, your, your wife, your kids, you know, your farm. Everything's gone. And here you are, and you represent mankind sitting in a pile of ashes. You know, you're sitting here dying. Cancer. You're about ready to go to the hospital and die now. Or, you know, you've lost your family. You don't know who you are anymore. What's happening? You don't know. Because you're the human race. And you feel like you're a slave. And you feel like you're suffering. And, and there's just all this suffering. Now, now let's, let's try to understand why you're suffering. Well, these people came to accuse Job. You know, like, like the devil, the accuser. And they said, Job, it's your fault. Well, Job says, no, I, um, it's not my fault. I didn't do anything. I didn't do, I don't deserve this, Job says. Uh-oh, boy. How could Job be so wise? And yet he's telling you some of the things that I've been telling you. Some of the things that I think this apostle Paul was trying to teach you. You know, hey. There ain't no righteousness through keeping laws. I'm not guilty. That's not why I'm I'm sitting here, you know, and I don't know why Job says. I, I don't know. I want to find out. Well, they came to him one by one and they started to tell him that it was his fault. He'd broken some law. He'd done something wrong. He was accursed. It was his fault. Well, the, the, the story continues, and we get to see behind the scenes what's really going on. And here's what's really going on. Satan is tormenting him, torturing him. Satan had taken everything he had. He was wrathful and mean and angry, and he was trying to kill him. Why? Because Job was somebody on a mission to learn. Well, I want you to understand this book of Job. You see, because Job is not on trial. God is. It's not about Job. This is about what's really going on. Okay? And many of you who believe in the law says that here's what's really going on. We're all a bunch of sinners. And we deserve to die. And we're all going to hell. And God is just sitting up there waiting for us to break one of his laws so he can send us to hell. Because that's all he's got to do is sit up there and take account and write down everything we do in the book of life. If we don't get written in the book of life, boop, we're gone. Because Job is, um, he's being persecuted. God says to, to the accuser, he says, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth. He's innocent. He's a virtuous man, turns away from evil. Now, for any of you out there who still wants to believe that we're all sinners and every man has sinned and, and deserves to die and deserves the suffering and deserves the consequences of what's going on in this world, then you ex explain this to me. God speaks and says that Job is innocent. So why is Job suffering? Job says, I came forth naked from my mother's womb, and naked I'll return. Blessed is the name of God, and all of this Job did not sin. And he did not ascribe any wrongdoing to God. See, God's on trial here, not Job. Because human beings were innocent. There was never a question as to, you know, with the higher priesthood over there in the east, they knew. This wasn't about man trying to appease an angry God. This wasn't about man being, you know, somehow a sinner and from the, you know, original sin. He did, we all deserve to die. Never, never was the truth. God himself declares Job innocent. And through all that Job went through, even through all of his sufferings, he never sinned. And this represents all mankind. Job represents you, friend. You're not a sinner. And our Father in Heaven's not a sinner either. Okay? Because you and I both know we'll not ascribe any sin to our God. Because there is no darkness in union with Him. 
So what's the problem, friends? We, we've ruled out Job. We've ruled out God. Why are we suffering down here? Hmm. It's probably that accuser, isn't it? He's probably the one. That's right. Then we've got another person that jumps in. She's got something to say, and that's Job's wife. Now, remember, we've talked about who the woman represents. That's the body. See, our body's going to complain. We don't accuse God, no. Through all of our suffering, we never accuse God. He's not at fault. But our body might. You know, when sometimes maybe the, it gets to, you know, the pain gets a little hard. And maybe we'll say, hey, are you still maintaining your innocence? Why don't you curse God and die? That's what, that's what the woman said. You are speaking like one of the foolish women, he said to her. Should we receive from God and not receive evil? We receive good, but we don't receive evil. In all of this, Job still never sinned. And that's in Job 2 and verse 9 through 10. This is the big question, and you've got to know the answer. Okay, are we under some laws, and we've been, you know, declared guilty, and therefore we're all bad? Sometimes we feel like it, and sometimes our, our body will whisper in our ear and say, you know, we should just blame God for all of this. It's probably God. He wants to kill us all. Now remember, from Job chapter 4 on to, clear up to chapter 31, most of the book of Job, Job's conversing with these three friends, Iliophaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And it's basically about, why are we suffering? Why do human beings suffer? Is it because we're sinners? So they argued that suffering is basically a punishment for sin and prosperity is a reward for the righteous. Chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Eliphaz, he believed that, you know, it was his wickedness that, that caused all of this. He, he, he says in 22, verse 5, your wickedness is great, Job. All right. But Job defended himself. And he says, there is good evidence from all over the world that the wicked often prosper and that righteous people suffer. 21 verse 29 through 30. And so this proves that it has nothing to do with, you know, we're, we're, we're sinners. That's why we're suffering. See, look at how this book goes into all this to try to explain it to you. So those of you that are reading just the laws of Moses, spend some time reading this book because this is wisdom. All right, lots of wicked people, they prosper. And lots of good people, they suffer. So it can't, we're not suffering for our sins, right? Makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? Well, that's, that's right out of the Bible. So, Iliophad, Bildad, and Zophar, they were not able to sustain their theories. The theory that we're all suffering because we sinned and broke the law of Moses. Okay, it wasn't God's fault and it wasn't Job's fault. Hmm. What's the answer? That's where a lot of people will, will take a, a verse out of Job or Psalms and say, see, the dead die and that's it and they don't know nothing. Well, sometimes you're, you're reading in the Bible and you're reading somebody like Eliphaz or, or something and, and, or Bildad or Zophar and they, they didn't tell the truth. Because here in a minute I'm going to show you that God says everything they said was a lie. See, there's stuff written in the Bible that's not even true and it's a lie because it was written by, by men who were just arguing and reasoning with their carnal mind. And there's things in the book of Ecclesiastes like that too. Where, uh, where he says, under the sun he considered wisdom and it was all folly. And he says, who knoweth? Who knoweth from those under the sun, from our position and our standpoint, who knows whether the spirit of man ascendeth upward? You see, or the spirit of the beast ascendeth downward to the earth. We don't know from our point of view. And so here we got here in uh, the book of Job, and we got these, these guys that think they know everything, and their position is that, you know, Job deserved it. He did something wrong. And Job's position is, I didn't do anything. It ain't my fault. So God jumps on the scene in chapter 38, and he says, and he answered Job from a whirlwind. He says, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man. Because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. All right, now a lot of people get to that point, and they think, oh, well, see, Job was really, really a sinner. Now God's going to come straighten him out. No, uh, the Bible says 
very clearly up to this point, Job did not sin. God himself told Satan, you see this man down there, he's innocent. Okay, so that's not what it's saying here. He come out of the whirlwind and he says there's ignorant words being spoken here. But he didn't say Job was, was a sinner. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. All he's telling Job is you don't know very much. You are asleep. See, you, you don't know why you're suffering. It's not because you're a sinner. It's because you're ignorant. You don't know why. And I'm going to tell you. And these other three yahoos that are telling you that you're a sinner. And that's why you're suffering. They're wrong. And I'm going to tell you that in a minute. Because, you know, he, he really lays into the, you know, these other guys, Iliophaz and, and these other three. But at this point, he's just telling Job, you don't know anything. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? You were there when all the children of God applauded for joy. You were part of my, my children, the stars, the people of the stars. Why do you think he calls them, you know, the stars of heaven? It means the people on the stars. And then he goes on and talks about, you know, all his creation, his wonderful things. He goes through, um, he talks about Behemoth and Leviathan. You know, he talks about the, uh, the Pleiades and the Orion and, and binding there and loosing their cords. Because he's talking about the astrological forces. See, Behemoth is this beast. Leviathan's the dragon. And the dragon's up there in the sky, and, and he's after the woman. See, God's really trying to explain what's going on here. You see, there's some physical forces that are that are keeping us down, that we're trying to overcome. We've got to go through this, this suffering, not because we're sinners, but because God's ways are wonderful and 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 amazing. That we're in a we're on a journey. He says, "Where were you?" All humans are on a journey, friends. And our father made Lucifer and allowed Satan to come in there and torture us and put him in charge of all these physical forces, these earthly things in the world that accuses day and night and makes us suffer. And we are one step, you know, each day we, we, we conquer a little bit more. We conquer the flesh. We crucify it. Okay, We're not at fault. We're on a journey. You know, do you know when the wild goats give birth? Uh, Job says he scratches his head. No, um, I guess I don't. Have you watched a deer when he was born in the wild? Do you know how many months there that they carry their young? Well, Job's like, no, actually, I guess I don't. You know, there's a lot of things I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of things we don't know, friends. But it's not, it's not that we're all sinners and we deserve to die and God doesn't love us. But Behind the scenes, what we don't know is Satan's up there accusing us. All right? And so the question is, is why does God let Satan accuse us? Well, that's what this is answering, friends. Because the whole book starts off with Satan up there accusing us. And we, we lose our, all of our sheep and, you know, and our, our flocks and, and our sustenance and our homes and our wives, which represents our body. You know, we die. And, and and we don't understand, you see, well, we've been on this journey for a long time, but somehow or another, we don't know why. Why did God have to make Behemoth? Why did God have to make this Leviathan? Boy, he's just mean. You got fire shooting out his nostrils. Oh, my goodness. He, he's mean. All right? But, you see, God's got grace. He made the, the wild goats give birth in the desert, you know, and the deers and and these beautiful things and, and 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 so there's a beauty behind all of it there's a reason behind all of it it says will the wild ox be tamed will it spend the night in your stall will you hitch a wild ox to a plow you see he's talking about this plow of this flesh oh it's 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 got power well, if you think the flesh is powerful, imagine the man who created it, the being, the spirit of all this universe who created these powers. And why did he make them? Can you tame them? Well, that's what we're here to do. Because you see, we are the children of the living God. We're going to put a bit in that cow's mouth and we're going to tame it. We're here to conquer 
the zodiac. We're here to conquer these zoo zoo zoological animals in the sky. That's what this is about, friends. Not because we're sinners. It's not because, you know, Moses wrote down these laws and we broke one of them. Read this book. This is part of the scripture. But when you read this book, friends, you're going to have to use wisdom. Okay, you're going to be reading about Leviathans and behemoths, you know, and, and, and star systems like the Pleiades and the bear. You're going to need wisdom. You're going to have to discern between the flesh and the bone. Okay, so many of you out there I, I'm, I are watching this and you're, and you're condemning these teachings. But you, 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 you told me to be careful and you've warned me. Well, I'm not warning you because I know that we're all doing the best we can. But I'm counseling you, all of you out there who, who has been basically condemning these teachings that we're, that we're discussing and, 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 and studying here together and learning together. And you're condemning me because I want to read these books and I want to understand. I'm, I'm counseling you to read some of the weightier, more deeper things in Scripture and read it deeply. Let go of your fear, friends, because you need to be able to, to dig deep in order to understand so that you won't, you know, that your bitterness and your anger is coming from your fear, friends. Let go. Let go of your prejudice. Don't be afraid to be sincere. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know, and I want to know. All of you out there, you've got to read the Bible in its entirety. And when Paul says, all things are lawful, if that statement is from, from one of the apostles, and it's true, then we've got to understand it. It's a simple statement. There are places in the Bible that are very complicated, you know, and you've got to understand them and discern. But this is very, this one verse is very simple where Paul says we're not under law. We, all things are lawful. You can't get any more in the word all. It means everything. So everything is lawful. We say, well, how can that be? We can't go out and murder people. No, yet under the law, if you were under a law, you, you, you wouldn't be allowed to do it under the law. If you're not under law, that means you are allowed to do whatever you want. Okay, that doesn't mean you'd want to do it. Not all things are advantageous. The point is, is that we are not under the law. That's just a statement. Everything else is going to be discerned and comprehended from that point of view. We're not under law. I want you to understand that. Many of you try to explain that verse and you want to throw all these other verses in there and say, well, well, look at this verse. It says that we shouldn't do bad. And look at this one. It says that poison will kill us. And look at this one. It says that fornicators are going to, you know, perish. See? Hey, I... Fornications... Fornicators are going to perish the same way as somebody who drinks a bottle of a poison. It's not good for you. So it's going to kill you. All right? But a man who's not under law will still die by drinking poison because it's not advantageous. It's not good for you. All right? You, you may be the son of the king. You can do anything you want. You can drink poison if you want. We're not under law, but we're learning. We're children of God. We want to be wise. So we don't need laws to tell us what's right and wrong. We need wisdom. You see the difference, friends? We need wisdom. And so God is explaining in this ancient book why we suffer. And it's not because we broke a law. It's because we're learning wisdom. And this thing is really, really, really deep. We've got to understand that the whole universe was created by God for us. We are the children of God. We are the, we are the children of the stars. We've been going, you know, we were there in the founding of the world. We were, we've been going on our old journey. And, and, and now we're, we're finding out why God made Behemoth and Leviathan and, 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 the, and his cords that pull us and his rule over the earth. See, we can control the beast of Taurus and put a bit in its mouth. We can overcome the flesh. And this is the reason that we're here, friends. And so, friends, I think I'll stop there because, I mean, I could carry on and on and on for hours. And these videos go into, you know, 
great length and and um I have to keep them about you know down to about an hour friends so friends i I hope this helps some of you and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and sign out you guys have a great week this is David Bose.